Welcome. I'm Frank Gavin, uh, I'm a professor of the LBJ School and director of the Robert S. Trout Center for International Security and Law. And anyone who knows me knows that this is really my favorite day in the calendar for the Strauss Center. The day that we get to hear from the remarkable students who are the Crook Fellows uh, and to hear the amazing things that they um, did over the summer and learn about their experiences and learn about all the extraordinary things that uh, this is the program makes it possible for us. It's hard to believe, but this program's in its sixth year. Uh, and it's a program that, uh, as everybody knows, provides summer fellowships for students doing nonprofit work in the developing country. And we were looking over the list of what people have done, what they've done in the past, and where they are now. And it truly is remarkable. We were talking earlier about how transformative it had been in people's lives. So since 2008, we've had 49 49 Crook Fellows to work in development projects in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. And I think one of the things that's been really remarkable, at least for me, and I know we've talked about this a lot, is the wide range and scope and variety of different kinds of programs that they've worked in. Uh, pretty much everywhere around the world, uh, expanding our notion of what development is, expanding our notion of how students uh, can go and can make a difference. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is not just the difference in the lives of the students that are made during the summer and on the projects and the people whose lives they touch where they go. It's very interesting to see the career trajectories of the Crook Fellow uh, winners and where they go after they graduate from LBJ. Um, we have many students who are working in development abroad right now. We have someone who's working at Development Gateway in Malawi. We have someone working in Ghana on the Innovation for Poverty Action Program. Uh, someone else working on the Committee for Migrant Workers in El Salvador. Uh, someone else working in the Development Alternative uh, Incorporated. Uh, this is just the beginning of the list of those people who never probably would have found these career opportunities or found this passion to work in these development um, uh, positions if not for the Crook Fellowships. Uh, many former fellows are working in, on development policy in positions in the U.S. government. This is something we've talked about quite a bit about the sort of change from the sort of back in the day when people worked in the State Department and now they work in NGOs. But we have lots of people who have gone off to work in the government. We have lots of people at the USAID office uh, doing U.S. foreign uh, disaster assistance. We have alumni at the Brookings Institution, at the Global Grassroots Business Fund at the Global Gender Program at George Washington University. So it's really a remarkable legacy. Uh, it's not just what happens during the summer, but uh, these students' lives have been altered forever because of being involved in this program, which is really exciting. Now, as everyone knows, the fellowships are sponsored by the William H. Crook Program, which is dedicated to promoting global economic development uh, policy and fighting poverty. And the program is, of course, made possible by the extraordinary generosity of Mrs. Eleanor Crook, uh, who established uh, this program to honor her late husband, William H. Crook, who was a prominent public figure in Texas politics and a pioneer in the field of global development. And if we could take a moment and just thank Eleanor for all she's done. Some of you know this is going to be the last Crook Fellows uh, event that I host, which is very, very bittersweet. There's not a program that I'm more proud of being involved in. But we are very, very lucky uh, that Mrs. Crook is still being uh, is, is supportive of the program and, and takes such great interest in it. We're also very lucky that we have someone who I think is going to do an absolutely terrific uh, job uh, uh, managing the program, seeing it grow, building it even further. And that's Bobby Chesney. So I'd like uh, to introduce, for those of the LBJ School who haven't had a chance to meet Professor Chesney, um, uh, I thought maybe he could say a few words. Thanks, Frank. Uh, thanks to all of you for letting me have just a moment of your time. I'll be very brief uh, because you're not here to see me. You're here to see the fellows, as, as you should be. I do want to say, when I, when I first came to UT, I'd been at another school, 
come to UT was very attractive for a host of reasons, one of which was because I was from the area, another was because it's a, it's a tier one research university with all these different schools and departments and opportunities for interdisciplinary cooperation. And this, in looking into this, I quickly discovered the Strauss Center, started learning about it, and I well recall looking for the first time at the Strauss Center's materials and thinking, well, you know, every university is full of centers and often it's just letterhead, maybe they put on a conference or two here and there but they don't necessarily make a real difference in the world. And one of the things that jumps out to you immediately when you go to the Strauss Center website is the Crook Program. And I, I very much remember thinking, about, now this is something different than what you usually see with the centers. Here's something that's making a difference in the lives of students and a difference in the world. And I began to learn more about Ambassador Crook and about Mrs. Crook and about what their, what their past experiences were that, that went hand in glove with this type of program. And I thought, what a nice marriage of, of interest, experience, and what universities should be doing and what university research centers ought to be doing. Making a real difference in the world. I, I was really impressed then. That was right about the time the program was, was just getting underway. It was still relatively new. And over, over the years since then, I've watched as batch after, after batch of tremendously talented students come through. Students who way outclass the students that Frank and I once were. We're fortunate not to be competing out there in the world with you people now. Um, <laughs> it's just been a real source of pride, and, and as I um, end up trying to fill Frank's shoes in the spring, um, one of, job one is, is preserving the momentum that you all have established and, and, and doubling down our efforts on the Crick Fellowship Program, because it's just the most amazing thing. It's a, it's a crown jewel for UT, and I'm very proud to be associated with this, and I thank you, Mrs. Crick, for your support for it. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Bobby. I think Bobby's just going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, for those students who are first years, uh, uh, you're going to see this, uh, you should not hesitate to talk to me, to talk to Jessica, to talk to Jacqueline, to talk to Ashley. We will have um, uh, a session that actually helps lay out uh, what the program's all about, to help you with your applications, um, to help see if the interest you have fit in with the Crook uh, uh, Development Program. So stay tuned for that. Without any further ado, let's turn it over to the students who will give their presentations and then we will have a discussion and question and answer. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bilal Dovani and I'm a second year global policy student here. I'm an international student from Pakistan and my interests are centered on international development, public-private partnerships, and participatory. So over the summer, I had the tremendous opportunity to go to Ghana and work with Innovations for Poverty Action. This was an organization I was extremely interested in and I had studied a bit through my coursework. And this was a prime opportunity for me to actually participate and witness hands on the kind of work they do. So a bit about IPA itself, it's a leading development research organization and their entire motto is to have evidence-based programs and evidence-based policies in the development sphere. So in that context, they do evaluations for other larger organizations. They also partner with the governments of several countries, and they have literally exploded over the past five years. And what is particularly attractive about that uh, organization for me was that they have employ a lot of people from the same country and they have a very strong grassroots presence. So when they go out and evaluate the program, they're extremely rigorous and they have very good in-country knowledge. And that, I thought, would be a very good opportunity for me to learn from. What was also remarkable about this opportunity was like the Crooks Fellowship Program was also very flexible for me because initially I had applied for another program, another project within the organization, and that fell through, but I was also able to transfer my fellowship onto the one where I was working on. So I was working on the Teacher Community Assistance Initiative, and this is essentially a program with the government of Ghana to see how the education sector can be improved. So what's happening in Ghana right now is the government is investing heavily in the education system and infrastructure. Around 23, 30% of the national budget goes into education. And they have made tremendous strides in increasing the attendance and enrollment. But what is not happening is that primary education basic skills, numeracy, literacy have not gone up. To investigate why this is the case, and then to solve these problems, IPA partnered with the Guinean government, and over the last three years, 
they tried out different interventions. <coughs> like the idea was to see what worked best in the context of Ghana's education system and the resources already available to them. So they tried out teacher training programs, how you could essentially teach to teachers to teach at the level of the students, because what happens in a lot of developing countries is <coughs> that within one class, there'll be students who are nine years old and 14 years old with different levels. And that's something that people don't really have the expertise or skills to target. Also, we tried out if adding community teachers, students who had graduated but were not able to progress on to higher education to the school environment and see if the inclusion of community teacher, teachers makes an impact or not. So over the course of four years, three years, they managed to evaluate all these different interventions. And when I was there, I started smack in the middle of everything. This was their last final endline survey and they were extremely excited and hopeful for it. Luckily for me, they gave me a lot of responsibilities. And this was the perfect mix of working in the office as well as roaming around in the field and getting a lot done. So what I essentially did was initially design their data collection system because this is a huge endeavor. They were tracking 40,000 students over three years across 100 districts in Ghana. And these are the plains, the mountains, the bush, everything. And they had a very large sample to work with. So I was essentially responsible to organize the teams, see how they will go out in the field and collect information. And then after designing the system, I was able to go into the field myself, see how what I had designed was working, and then incorporate their feedback back into the program. This was a very good opportunity for me as well because I got to interact one-on-one -on -one with the teachers and the headmasters on the ground and also take a couple of in-depth interviews with a number of students. It's very funny because every school you go to, it struck me particularly because from being from Pakistan, there is a slight colonial legacy that is persistent and common across the world. The schools looked the same, the kind of attitude was the same, the teachers were also kind of, there were some teachers, there were some teachers that weren't teaching, but the community teachers were more involved in that sense. And every school you went into, you would be greeted by a huge, like large group of students and they would say, hello, Abroni, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. It's like, Abroni means like someone with slightly whiter, lighter skin. So that was funny because there's this one script that they had learned and this one they repeat me every single time. But it was a remarkable experience. And what was good for me uh, for my professional development was that I got to work with the executive director of the organization itself, Annie Duflo, because she was the principal investigator on my program. So that made, that gave me a lot of chances to see how you manage such large scale programs which are meant to inform education policy in the developing world. And I really enjoyed my stay. I remember like trying to work on the computer while being thrown around in the car and traveling up to eight hours a day. But the climate was amazing. I literally could not handle myself when I got back to Texas because it was so hot. <laughs> I was completely not what I expected. But overall, I had an amazing time. And I just think I'm very lucky to have this opportunity. Thank you. Hi, I'm Helen. Um, I'm also a second year global policy student. And this summer, I also worked for IPA Ghana. I was in a different office, though. I was in the northern office of Tomale. And I did actually two projects this summer. One was for IPA, which I'll start first. And then the second one was for an organization called Exponential Education. Um, so my project for IPA was, uh, and the wall explained very well what IPA actually did. What my project was, was the ultra poor graduation project, which means we were trying to find ways to get people that were in the ultra poor level under $1 a day, like to find what resources would lift them up so that they you know, um, come up over that level and then are able to use other resources. Um, and this was called, yeah, gra gra Graduation from Ultra Poverty. Um, so what we did was we had a series of different interventions. One was an asset transfer intervention. The other one was a savings intervention. The other one was a bags intervention that researched labor elasticity. And each community would have either one or some type of combination. And then we had control communities that we also monitored. Um, 
And this project specifically was implemented already in India, Pakistan, Honduras, Peru, Ethiopia, and was being replicated in Ghana to see if it would work and if this is something that the government should scale up into a policy. So what I did this summer was I was part of both the data management and um, the field team. So I went out half of the time and like we took bikes and I would drive out for three hours on dirt roads because there were definitely no roads and it was like not even a dirt road, it was like a dirt pathway that was like six inches wide for about three hours until we came to these very, very, very rural communities because they were all at the ultra poor level. Um, and I would make sure that we would implement all of the surveys with the team and I, I pretty much was just managing one of the survey teams and I would go around to the different teams to make sure that everything was running smoothly. And uh, honestly on the ground, the largest problems I encountered was actually like very bizarre laptop explosions. Like we had to program, not really, but we had to program all of this survey information so that survey, local surveyors on the ground were able to easily take survey information. And um, all the time, like these programs would just somehow unprogram these themselves and do something weird. So that was a lot of my time on the ground, along with just working with all the people. They all spoke in the local dialects. And so I just had to make sure that everyone was like taking enough time and making sure that the consent seemed like it was really getting through and um, just leading all of the field work. The other part of my uh, internship was the data management, similar to Bilal, where I would just manage, analyze, and clean the data that was incoming. That I like literally went out to the field to collect and then I come back and I started to manage and clean it. Um, and the other organization that we were working with was our nonprofit, and I did this with my colleague Bilal Bawani. And we started at the beginning of the summer before our IPA internship. And we went to Exponential Education is a nonprofit that I created a few years ago. And we do peer-on-peer after-school tutoring. And what happens is that high school students um, that are in need of financial assistance get assigned to tutor junior high school students. And in return, they receive their uh, school fee stipends. And this program's been running for a year, few years. And so what we went to do was expand it, create a formal type of evaluation system, or at least get the process started. And we also went with the intention to create a for-profit arm so that the nonprofit can have a larger sustainable funding source. Um, so we pretty much landed in Ghana. We took the operational director on the ground, took us to all of our the villages where our program was running and we got to meet all the kids. Um, I think we like had the graduation ceremonies and we gave out all these meat pies that made me very sick, but I think I'm hoping that everyone else was totally fine. Um, and we started to formalize structures and systems and we actually learned and used a lot we took, uh, from IPA and all of their evaluation systems and just a lot of their internal structure and started adopting it and using it into exponential education. And in the summer, we also hired staff. We interviewed them um, when they were in the States and we hired and brought them in to Ghana. And they started running more and more programs along with our Peace Corps partners who were also running programs in Peace Corps villages. And we hired someone to start an SAT tutoring business to um, try to gain revenue. So throughout the entire IPA process, we were also setting up this entire thing, which is was on the ground making sure that our village programs were running well and that the staff team there was organized and just creating a lot of internal structure. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add? Sorry for the transition. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. I enjoyed like creating structures in this because as the organization is growing really fast, it's very important to have those financial supporting systems and those evaluation and it's really great how can have that kind of reach and gain more and gain more funds to expand our program. Exactly. And it was also great just seeing all of the kids. You know, we get like letters from them and we get the scholarship. Um, they report when they want scholarships and so we actually get to meet the kids that have been getting scholarships and stuff. So that is what I did with my summer and it was extremely amazing. And all of the skills I learned in IPA have actually helped me this year as I got a new job doing working in a data lab and that was directly from my Crooks um, experience. So. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is
name is Rahima Hussaini and uh, I'm also a second year MJPS student. So um, this summer I decided to go to Kabul, Afghanistan. Um, even though I had a very hard time getting uh, travel approval from the IOC office because Afghanistan is a security-wise, it's an unstable region, but I had to fill out a lot of forms promising them that I won't go anywhere after seven o'clock. Everywhere that I'll go, I'll be with my mom and dad, accompanied by them, but eventually they allowed me to go. So it was um, a, a great experience as I got to work with uh, Women and Children Legal Research Foundation. Uh, it was a small nonprofit organization. And I was very interested in working with this nonprofit because previously I had worked with bigger organizations and usually bigger organizations, they um, uh, <coughs> don't do the actual on the ground work. They hire smaller organizations to do it for them. So I really wanted to do work with this small local uh, organization so I could be actually on the ground and see how they do their work. Um, so, um, yes, uh, Women in uh, WC Award is a small nonprofit organization and it actually uh, uh, collects data, uh, does research on various aspects of women's life and then publishes reports and does other um, media work uh, to uh, create, uh, raise awareness about women problems and issues in Afghanistan. So when I went there, they were working on a project that was called uh, uh, Customs and Tradition that Violates Rights of Women, unfortunately, in Afghanistan for the past 20 years because of the war. Um, and before that, there have been a lot of customs in the society, like early marriages or forced marriages, women's lack of access to education, health services, and very little work has been done in this field. So uh, we were actually going to go uh, and conduct survey in 20 provinces in Afghanistan. Uh, we were going to survey 516 women, of which 500 were going to be like uh, household women and 16. Um, Can you speak up a little, please? Can you a little louder? Okay. Um, we were going to uh, go to 20 provinces in Afghanistan out of 34. We couldn't go to all 34 because of security reasons. So we went to 20, 20 provinces we were, we, where we were going to inter, uh, survey or interview 20, no sorry, 500, 516 women out of which 500 were uh, housewives and 16 were women working with government or non-government uh, organizations. And we were going to ask them different questions, uh, which were about if they had ever been victims of any kind of those traditions uh, and uh, cultures that exist in Afghanistan, if they have been victims of them. And after collecting the data from the uh, 20 provinces, we published a report and uh, we first um, entered the um, data that we collected into database and after that we compiled the report and I had to translate the report from Dari to English, which was actually a bit hard for me because they are the reports that they write, um, um, they, the, they write reports in Dari language and I, it was a bit hard for me because my daddy is not very strong. And also um, if <laughs> Dr. Weaver had seen those reports, she would have called them the reports on steroids because they were <laughs> extremely lengthy and they were using a very difficult uh, language, a very scholarly language, but um, I tried to convince them that these reports will be read by different people in the community, and most of them, they do not have such a higher le level of education, so in order for them to understand them, but I don't know, I guess um, to them it looked kind of good to write such difficult reports, but anyhow, I had to translate those reports to English, and. Um, after translating the report, they were going to take uh, the matter up to the legislative in the parliament and they were going to try to push for a law that was going to ban the practice of these um, traditions and the Afghan culture that um, uh, violate the rights of women. And I also had, um, I also went to a gender uh, group meeting that was organized by the State Department in Kabul they invited women from various walks of life. Um, there were uh, students, UN uh, spokesperson, uh, women who had their own small businesses from the media. And basically it was just like an open discussion 
it was a great opportunity to network and talk to these women what, what did they think about the progress that has been done in women's life since uh, 2001 and what did the women generally think about um, the future in the next year, 2014, um, when the American troops will withdraw. And it was very interesting to hear them like say that they have done so much work for other women in Afghanistan and that they still want to continue working and they don't want to back uh, back away and, and, and sit in their homes while they can do so much work. So they were really hoping that next year they there would be positive changes and um, they would still have a place to work and can contribute to the society. So this was my experience. I am a second year GPS here at the LBJ School and dual degree with the Energy and Earth Resources um, School at Jackson. And my interests are primarily water resource management in the developing world. Um, so, okay. I also was at Innovations for Poverty Action, but I was in Zambia. And I decided that Innovations for Poverty Action seemed like a good place to work because we learned a lot about it in Kate Weaver's development class, and I was really drawn to their kind of scientific approach to development. A lot of other organizations just kind of boil around throwing interventions at people, and I really liked that they had that uh, really targeted scientific approach. Um, so I won't re-explain what they do, but Innovations for Poverty Action Zambia is one of their smaller offices. They have about 10 full-time employees and usually two to three ongoing randomized control trials. So this was actually really, really nice. I got to know everyone I was working with really well, um, including all the Zambian practitioners. It was nice because I could talk to them about elements of my project that maybe I wouldn't understand because I was dealing with culture mostly. Um, our office was in this residential area, this house which was also awesome because we had a kitchen and we'd take turns making lunch for each other every day. Um, but it was also kind of crowded sometimes. You can see that's me working in the kitchen. There's computers and boxes everywhere. It's been hectic. Um, so my responsibilities for this internship were mostly focused on this gender and agriculture project that I'll go into more detail about in a little bit. But basically I was in charge of data collection, data analysis, making GIS maps, for that and then writing a final report. Um, but I also did some networking. I got to go out into the field on some of the other uh, RCTPs that they were doing. I represented IPA at the Agricultural Fair, which doesn't sound very exciting, but it's like the biggest social event in Lusaka every year. So that was pretty fun. And I got to go out to Mukomi Village, which is right outside Livingston, where Victoria Falls is, and kind of interview their prime minister Mr. Stanley, and uh, talk about their water resource issues, which was really fun. Um, okay, so my project was the Gender and Agriculture Project, and it was essentially a failed RCT from 2012. It was failed before I got there. I wouldn't be telling you about it if I made it fail. Um, but so originally, they were trying to look at how, um, like, intra-household decision making and labor distribution affect agricultural technology adoption. Um, so for instance, if men in the family are making most of the decisions uh, in terms of what to invest their money in, are they less likely to invest in a technology that'll lighten the labor load of their wives or, you know, yeah. So originally they had done all of these uh, focus groups um, with the community that had told them that women do most of the weeding in these communities. And that was really um, in line with a lot of the anthropological information that was out there. So they ran with it and designed this entire project around herbicides as the technology, if that makes sense. Um, but then it turned out that men do all kinds of weeding and they really love herbicides. So it didn't really work out the way they had expected. So they tried to 
remake this project a few different times, but um, they couldn't really figure out a way to make it work, so they decided that an exploratory report would be more appropriate, which is what I was brought in to work on. Um, so this exploratory report basically consists of a mini database with around 70 different variables that have to do with um, culture, general demographics, and agriculture in Zambia um, at the district level. Uh, and then a report that synthesizes this data with existing ideas about gender norms. And the rationale was that this project failed because the traditional anthropological ideas weren't matching up with reality. So we need to like investigate where those holes might be. Um, so I had a lot of results because it was a very, very broad report, but this is just kind of an example of the kind of stuff I was looking at. Um, we were using a lot of national level surveys. Um, this is the top is from the DHS 2007 uh, survey, which is all of Zambia. Um, and basically a lot of the data showed that gender roles are pretty much what we think they are in the anthropological research. So in Zambia, people, basically women are in charge of the domestic realm and anything that's like a daily activity, whereas men are in charge of how the household interacts with the society and big, you know, big events like building the house or plowing the field at the beginning of the year. Um, so that's kind of supported by this. Um, you can see women have overwhelmingly the final say on daily purchases, whereas men um, have the final say over large purchases. Um, but the exception to this is in communal versus male crops. So along with that domestic outside divide, um, women are traditionally in charge of subsistence crops because that's what they're using within the household whereas men are in charge of cash crops because they're selling them um, outside the household. Uh, so in 2000, you could really see that in the census data on what crops were being um, planted by who. Female-headed households had lower rates of cash crop cultivation relative to men and higher rates of subsistence crop cultivation. Um, but then in 2010, when you deal with the data the exact same way, you see that there's almost no difference at all, and women are actually actually have higher cultivation rates for tobacco, which is obviously not a subsistence crop. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we were looking at. Uh, but I did get to get out of the <laughs> office a few different times. I got to go on a bunch of safaris, and I got licked by this cheetah, <laughs> and you know, can move the lower Zambezi and stuff like that. So I had a really amazing time. It was a great professional development opportunity and just life opportunity. So I'd like to give a big thank you to Mrs. Cook and Ms. Craft Center. Um, like all of my colleagues, I'm also a second year uh, global policy student. Um, I'm also in the uh, Middle Eastern Studies program across campus. And uh, I interned this summer with the Palestinian Hydrology Group in Ramallah, which is the sort of de facto capital of the Palestinian territories. Um, Palestinian Hydrology Group, or PHG, I'll call it, since it's a bit of a mouthful, is the largest um, Palestinian water resources NGO. Um, they operate all over the West Bank. Uh, they even have an office in Gaza. They do all kinds of water, sanitation, hygiene related projects. Um, I, did, I worked on a number of projects, but uh, mostly I was dealing with uh, household uh, level agriculture, small family farms. Uh, hence this picture, this is a sort of impromptu meal that a family fed uh, myself and some of my research colleagues. And it's all freshly prepared and homegrown, and it was delicious. <laughs> anyway, um, the 
first thing I worked on, less related to agriculture, but very important, uh, is wastewater treatment. Uh, it's a significant sort of development sanitation and hygiene issue in the Palestinian territories. There are a lot of reasons for that, politics and economics and environmental issues. Um, and so we were uh, trying to evaluate this. Uh, this actually is a wastewater treatment plant. Um, it looks very different from sort of Western ones. Um, and uh, PHG installed this a few years ago for this uh, Benizade municipality um, to treat their wastewater. Um, in the more rural areas, outside of basically the major cities of the West Bank, um, there's very little in the way of wastewater treatment or even wastewater disposal systems. Most families rely on cesspits, which are quite simply holes in the ground, um, which fill up and then must be emptied by pump trucks. Um, it's a significant expense for most families uh, in these areas. Um, and in addition, they often, I mean, they pollute groundwater, they often overflow, they attract insects. There, there's just a whole host of negative effects from these cesspits. So they were trying to, um, you know, have an alternative and, and have a, some sort of treatment system. Um, I kind of like it aesthetically. It's not very uh, assuming. It's, it just kind of fits in the hillside, which is nice. This down here is a constructed wetland. Um, there's uh, like a triple filtration system up here. Uh, it treats the water to a point where it can be safely just disposed of in the valley. Um, we were interviewing um, community members, trying to determine um, what incentives exist, because they had found that um, some people were choosing to stay with, with their cesspits, while other families were we're connecting to the, the network flowing to this treatment unit. So we were trying to figure out uh, what was going on there, what were the incentives, why were some connecting and some weren't. Um, first, I thought it was really interesting because the, the first thing we did was we met with the town council and the mayor and the city planner and engineers and it was just very, I don't, uh, very intriguing to, to see sort of the, those dynamics on a local level. Um, um, but anyway, more, more interesting to me, and what I really liked doing this summer was uh, <clears throat> I did some evaluation work uh, of their gray water treatment initiative. Um, they, PHG installs these gray water treatment units at the household level. Um, they've installed, I believe, 350 some odd uh, gray water treatment units. These are, gray water is all household wastewater, uh, except toilet water, black water. It represents about 80% of all household wastewater. Um, and this is trying to address a number of, of development issues in the Palestinian territories. Um, just to give you an idea, I mean, we know it's an arid region. Water is becoming more of an issue with, with climate change and changing rainfall patterns. But just to give you some idea, in, in the summer months, when, when it's much drier, um, some, some Palestinian families in these rural areas are spending up to a third of their income buying trucked-in water. So it's, it's a significant drain. I mean, it, it has implications for sanitation, household hygiene. Um, you know, it severely limits or, in many cases, precludes the possibility of agriculture um, because they're just barely subsisting uh, on the water they have. Um, but these units treat 80% of their wastewater uh, to a point where it's safe to use in agriculture. So it's turning something that is a liability because this wastewater previously is flowing to their cesspits, these are overflowing, they're spending hundreds of dollars a year pumping out these cesspits, and it turns that liability into a useful economic resource. And we get this. Um, in addition to the gray water treatment unit, PhD <coughs> space and funding is available, constructs a greenhouse and uh, drip irrigation systems, which maximize the efficiency of, of irrigation water. Um, none of this existed before the, the PhD intervention, the greenhouse and the, the treatment unit. Um, uh, this farmer has, has actually expanded his beyond the capacity of the gray water treatment unit he uses rainwater harvesting techniques and, 
and other things, just spurred on by his early successes in agriculture. Uh, this greenhouse is full of, of cucumbers. He's got tomatoes and various squashes and zucchini out, outside. Um, and so now this family, not only are they, they have shaved uh, uh, hundreds of dollars annually off the expense of emptying their cesspit, they're getting virtually all of their, their vegetables from their family garden, um, so they're more food secure, and they have a new income stream because they're selling a high volume of this produce at market. Um, well, I spent a lot of time uh, with, with this family in particular. My role here was uh, coming in after the implementa implementation of this program talking to the farmers and their families and trying to sort of quantify how much they benefit. How much money are you saving now on emptying your cesspit? How much, uh, you know, what's the, the value of the crops you're selling at market? What's the value that your family is consuming? Um, and we gained some really interesting insights and I, I think I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that I had a positive impact on it. <laughs> in PhD and their work and kind of defining their role. And I just had a really great time with these farming families. They were extremely hospitable. They fed us. They invited us to birthday parties after the fact. We got really quite involved with some of these people and it was, it was a fantastic experience. Um, and you know, on a personal note, I got to see a lot of the West Bank. I got to see Jerusalem and you know, I went to Tel Aviv and hosted by Israelis and Palestinians, and it was just a really, really tremendous experience personally and professionally. So, well, thank you, especially to the Strauss Center for administering this, but of course to Ms. Crook for making this possible because it really was essential to my being able to do this. So thank you very much. chatted and I sent him my resume and he 
said, if you want to come, we'll let you come and you can be an intern and learn all about the policies that govern all of these projects. So I spent the first half in Sao Paulo learning a lot about the national policies and then the regional policies and how those impact on the groundwork. And then I went from Sao Paulo to Belém, which is in the north part, and that's where Lyme and Amazon um, headquarters are. And something really cool in Sao Paulo, the Bible Society got a grant from Tom's, so I have my Tom's on, and they got a grant and they have, I wanna say it's about a million hayes, so $500,000 worth of shoes that they give to kids in different schools. And so I got to go be part of giving shoes to kids um, once in a hospital and once in a school. And it was fun because I had my Toms on. And so <laughs> they were like, look at the American girl that <laughs> has her Toms on. So that was um, fun, but a little weird at the same time. So um, my responsibilities on the boat kind of vary depending on what, what we did and the communities that we went to. And we took two long trips. And the first one was to Sao Miguel, and it took us 10 hours to get there by boat. And we parked out in front of this, um, they called it a city, but this is what it looked like. And this was the other side of the boat. So you can see that it's not really a city at all. But this is like their road that they use. And a lot of the people, I think in the first slide, there was a picture of a smaller boat. And that's, that would be their equivalent of a car. So if you think of this as their I-35, that's clearly not very busy. But and then their vehicle would be the little boat. And so just to give you a picture of the reality that these people live in. And on the first boat trip in San Miguel, I coordinated all the health services. Um, because there is, the people were basically waiting for you. We, we slept on the deck and the, in the hammock. And so every morning when I would wake up about 7, there were swarms of people all lined up waiting to get onto the boat because they don't have a doctor in their, uh, in their city. They don't have dentists. They don't have nurses. Sometimes if they have nurses, they were trained in very interesting ways and would never probably be a nurse here. And so a lot of these people need health care but don't have access to it. Or if there is, for some reason, health care there, they do not have the money to access it. And so the boat comes and brings volunteers who do, it's kind of like Doctors Without Borders, but on a boat in the Amazon. And so this was the area, this was after, this was at the very end of the day, people were still waiting um, to get into where the, the medical services are administered. And so I was in charge of coordinating all of that and making sure that each person had all the pieces that they needed so that they were served holistically on our boat. But it was really beautiful, as you can see <laughs> while we were there. The problems were, were not very beautiful, but the scenery definitely was. And on the second long activity, I did a lot of the cultural and educational activities. And here's a picture of us um, teaching the kids to brush their teeth. And we also talked to them about nutrition and how they should eat healthy. A lot of people here live near acai, which is imported here and is really expensive here, but um, they just kind of eat it like rice and beans. They eat acai and farinha, and um, yeah, and so they don't, it's difficult because even though we talk to them about nutrition, the reality is they don't have access to the choices that we do, and, um, and I found this out through a lot of interviews that I did while I was on the boat and asking the community how they've been impacted but also understanding what's the reality of some of their other needs that they have. And then we did, sat around and read stories about how everybody should be treated equally and then did some just fun activities with kids while we were in the villages. And so I think the biggest thing I learned was that it's easy to sit in a classroom and learn a lot about numbers and evaluating things and thinking about, okay, this is an issue, we should plan a program to fix it. But the reality is that people are always behind all of those issues and they all have faces, they all have real needs, and usually those needs are really complicated and a lot more complex. And this particular family, for instance, they live along the river, they're pretty marginalized from what society they have around them. They're one of the few families that don't have a motor on their boat, so it means they have to row everywhere. 
that about 30 people live in their home and there's a lot of domestic and sexual violence that goes on and goes unpunished because they're so marginalized and the economic opportunities are not an option, they have, they have no political power basically, and then no access to health care. But, but they're real people and these are the kind of people that I want to work for. And so it was a great opportunity to actually see these people and be with them and and know that they are, that they're real people. And um, these this family had a really special place in my heart. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity. Uh, it was really helpful. And now being in classes, when we think about development work, it's not just a theory, it's a reality, and that it's something that it's not necessarily always clean. It's a little messy. It doesn't always fit into a box or fit into well, we can just like organize it in this way and make sense of it this way because life's not, my life is messy, it's not super clean, but I'm very thankful for an opportunity to serve them. And these are pictures of some of the kids. This little boy was so excited because we painted on his arms and then just um, some fun moments in the community, working with kids and talking with the moms and, and just being with the people. So thank you very much. Last but not least, right? <laughs> and I'm Kelly Steffen. I'm a dual degree uh, here at the LBJ School, and then I'm also getting my MBA from Cum School of Business. So I spent the summer in Ethiopia uh, with the U.S. Agency for International Development. And I think, like where Yuma had talked about, I was a little worried that being a, a large organization, I wouldn't really get to be on the ground and helping individuals. But luckily. Um, I was placed at a smaller organization called FinTrack, which is implementing a USAID project in Ethiopia, and they're located in Addis Ababa. So I actually got to end up doing a lot of field work and meeting a lot of Ethiopians, which I was really happy about. So right away when I got there, like the first day, we have orientation at the embassy with USAID, and, and the partner, the head of the FinTrack, comes in, and he basically says, all right, Kelly, I'm glad you're here. You're going on an eight-day study tour with 50 Ethiopians tomorrow. Pack your bags. Um, so, and he was like, it's, everything's gonna be in Amharic, but you know, one of the 50 guys will translate for you. So it was a little overwhelming at first, but with the study tour, really, what FinTrack does is they um, are promoting agriculture in Ethiopia, and specifically developing leadership skills uh, with agriculture. And right now, like 85% of uh, Ethiopia's economy is based on agriculture. However, most of it isn't mechanized. It's very small farms, and there's not really great water systems. So my role specifically was also looking at how climate change is affecting Ethiopian agriculture. So the study tour was set up to visit different best practices throughout southern Ethiopia, and they took uh, men and three women uh, to visit all these different sites from different parts of Ethiopia so they could see what the southern region is doing best. Uh, so one of the first sites we went to was a smaller farm that had gotten funding to have a solar uh, pump. And so that farm is able to have better access to water. Uh, this one, you can't actually really see it, but we were visiting the Humbo Carbon Forest, which was the first, um, for, it was the first protected forest where people in the community were given money to not cut down the trees and not use it for firewood. Uh, so it was really interesting for the group to see it there. This is at an uh, avocado farm. And this is also at the same avocado farm to meet at the greenhouse. So it was really interesting that they take, so they take these people that work at the Ministry of Agriculture and they get to see how these best sites are implemented so they can develop strategies to scale up the good things that are happening. Um, and from there I had to write a report specifically on the good things of how they're adapting to climate change. Uh, my other two projects were again related on climate change. This is my office. So what I really liked specifically was that there was eight of us in the office and I was the only one working on climate change. So I think one is that I really got to bond with my colleagues quite a bit. They were constantly taking me to baby showers and weddings and things like that, which was really fun for me. And then uh, I also felt really utilized in the office. I think I, I think they benefited from me being there and I think I really benefited from me being there, which was really important for me. Um, 
So the, first, the second project was developing training materials, and these training materials were for the ministry to implement at the local level to give to farmers on how to best adapt to climate change. So different strategies that have been proven successful in Ethiopia already. The second thing that I, or the third thing that I really worked on the most was developing a climate change curriculum for Dredel University. It looks like Diradawa, so half the time when they said I was going to Dredel University, I had no clue what they were talking about because I, at the map, could only find Diradawa, not Dredel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with Haramaya University, both are agriculture universities in eastern Ethiopia. And so with them, we developed a climate change um, curriculum, and there's now 30 men in, I think, I guess 29 men and one woman enrolled in the program this year. Uh, so what they're really hoping then is to develop a new uh, set of leadership that can help lead Ethiopia forward um, with the climate change that's happening in the country. And what I, how I did that was I really looked at some of the best African universities, Nairobi University, McKelly University, and a few others, on how they're handling climate change and what different classes are, there, are people required to take, uh, what are some best practices, and also what skills do um, leaders need to really be able to be climate change um, leaders in the future. And so what I also found when I was there is that there was a second year who was in Addis Ababa the year before, and she warned me, she was like, bring your rain boots, bring your winter coat, it's gonna be cold, you're going during rainy season. And I had 30 beautiful days in June. So that's actually quite scary though, once you think, it was wonderful for me, but it's quite scary when you think about, they only had a two to three month uh, rainy season to, for their crops. And if it's not raining for a third of that time, that's, that's gonna be a big problem. Um, so they're, de they're definitely on the right track though for developing uh, strategies to move forward uh, in the face of climate change. Lastly, I gotta have a lot of fun in Ethiopia. So there were 17 USAID interns that were from um, universities all over the United States brought in and about half were placed at the embassy itself and the other half were placed at different organizations like mine. Um, one or two were working on agriculture, some were working on health, some were working on education. So it was really cool that I felt like I got to understand the whole development picture of what's happening in Ethiopia because someone was talking to me about the maternal projects they were working on. Well, someone was talking about literacy projects and we were constantly <coughs> swapping stats back and forth that I got to see a pretty cross-culture picture. Um, most ex well, some of the more exciting things was I got to go to an Ethiopia World Cup qualifier against South Africa, in which Ethiopia won, uh, so it was really fun for me. I also was, didn't want to bring my phone or my camera into the stadium because I was worried about them getting, get, getting stolen, so I gave my email out to about 15 different people <laughs> in hopes that they would send me a picture, and this is the one I got back. <laughs> um, I, this is Bionetu, which is one of the main Ethiopian dishes. Ethiopia has a pretty religious culture, and so they fast, fast every Wednesday and Friday, which means they don't eat meat, which is good for me as a vegetarian, that Wednesday and Friday I got the most delicious food. The other days of the week I was stuck with not as delicious food, but it was okay. Uh, this is at the market, women selling a lot of different spices. And then one of my more exciting things was that I fed a hyena meat from my mouth, uh, and that's in Eastern <laughs> Ethiopia. Uh, when I was visiting Haramaya University working on the climate change project. So um, my coworkers had originally called me Kelly Konjo, which is Kelly Beautiful. And then after this, they said they decided I wasn't Konjo anymore, and they <laughs> now called me Kelly Defar, which is Kelly the Brave One. So after that, that name kind of stuck. Um, so I just really want to say thank you. I really, I was, I had been abroad in developing country in undergrad, and I think I had kind of forgotten how much I like myself when I'm there, how I think it brings out the best characteristics of me when I'm in developing countries. So going back to Ethiopia really reaffirmed that I want to work in a developing country, and uh, that's where I want to be. So I really want to say thank you to you for giving me that experience and thank you to the Strauss Center because I think it put me back on track of where I want to go with my life.